Where did you first meet him? What happened? How did that happen when you first met him? Uh, he was walking down the hallway. 17 Yeah. That sounds strange. Well, just walking down the hall in the record company? The you hadn't known him before then? No. I never knew him before. And I said, no, who is this? You know, and my manager said, I think that you should work with him. And I said, no. And I said, she said, why not? And I said, well, you know, I worked with so many people and I had such a bad taste in my mouth that I, I didn't think that, um, you know, like, why should this be any different, you know? But it was different and I was wrong. And, that sounds kind of strange. A, a, a new artist in Motown and a two new artists getting together on a record. Does that usually happen like that all the time? No, it doesn't. I, I really don't know uh, why they did it, except for they probably were they probably were getting ready to let me go. <laughs> so you know, they said, "Well, let's let's do this last thing." What a loss they would have had. Uh, I think they were. But um, how long again, you with them I think they might have believed in him. Tina. How long had you been with him before Rick finally came out? Three and a half years. That long? Yeah. You never had a record out in all that time? Never. I never even got to sing in all that time. Well, I, I just sang by myself in my room and uh, to my friends. But, uh, God, it's not so terrible. But, um... Uh, you were writing songs had, for the men? I had to quit gigging and stuff because they didn't want me doing that. So I used all that time 
to um, get my writing gear. But it must have been it must have been real different. What was it like being a white girl among so many stars, legendary stars like Diana Ross and it, Stevie it, Wonder, Marvin Gaye? When I met Diana Ross, I was devastated. You know, a dream. Did you relate? Did you two get along? Yeah, know? she's real nice. You know? A dream that you have for so long, and then for it to all of a sudden come true. You know, it's like. Yeah. What about Stevie Wonder? We hear Stevie Wonder has a lot of respect for you. We hear, we hear you just did a benefit with Stevie. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, Steve called me up and uh, asked me to sing with him at the Roxy. We can't hear you. What was that? He called me up and asked me to sing with him at the Roxy. Well, that Miss Love thing they had. Right. It was a benefit for you to love. Yeah. Was who, was, uh, who was you to love? She was killed last year and, um, over Gasville. Over Gasville. And, um, I think about four policemen shot her or something. And uh, the benefit was for her children. You know, they're from the ghetto and you know, they don't have nothing. So, so in other words, Stevie decided to do yeah, something for the children. Yeah, he wanted to do something for the children. And he children. called on you to help participate. Yeah, he asked me to. I heard the mayor was supposed to be there and he didn't show up at the last minute. What was that? Oh, I, I didn't really know about all that. They wrote you up in the newspapers after that. The critics said you were the highlight of the evening. How did you feel about that? I mean, after all, Betty Wright was there, and Jermaine Jackson performed, and it was a star of the fair, and then the critic, top critic in L.A. writes you up as the... The meanest critic in L.A. You know, the greatest thing there. How did you feel about that? Well, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I don't think it was as much me as it was the song, I sang Deja Vu. And for the kind of benefit that it was, it was like the perfect song because the whole night was spiritual anyways, you know, and um, everybody could just like relate to it. You know? uh, I think that, that, was, that was like the golden, you know, feel. So what was it like working with Rick James in the studio for the first time? It was great. The energy level was like great. I mean, I've never experienced anything like that before. And the Stone nope. City Band, they played on your oh, first album, didn't they? Hello. Yeah, Hello. Tell us about the Stone City Band. Oh, everybody's great. Levi, Synthesizer, uh, Daniel Lamel, Sax, Anna Shoes, Drums. God, everybody. Did Rick let you express your own free, your own identity on the first album? Did you uh, feel? I think that's why it worked. Is there any I songs know. that you wrote on the first album? Yeah, I wrote um, I'm Gonna Have My Cake. What is that about? different kinds of music and your style is so variated and your expression is so authentic. What gives you this? What is what is it inside of you that makes you sing this? I just, you know, 
Yes. Hate to use the term, but you, you see so close related to a black experience when we hear you. I mean, and you're a white girl. I mean, where are you? Are you from? Have you lived amongst black people, or are you no. from the ghetto or um, Spring? I, I grew up in, in Venice. Were you poor? No, I wasn't poor, but you know, there was like an area. There was an area in Venice of about seven, eight blocks that was like considered a ghetto. I didn't know it was you know, a ghetto when I was there, but that's what they say now. But um, it was just like a lot of fun. Like Venice is like, I feel like the melting pot of Los Angeles, you know. Like you can go there and just about find anything. You know? It's right on the water, isn't it? Right. Must have been pretty. Like so it's definitely not a ghetto you're from. Um. Yeah, there's part of it is ghetto. Uh, yeah, it is now. Where I, it, it, it's you know, where I uh, hung around. All my, you know, like a lot of my friends. What was your family life? You have brothers and sisters. I have uh, two brothers and two sisters. What do they do? I have a, uh, well, the oldest are like they're married and you know, kids and I have the only one that's like a musical or anything is my little brother Tony, and uh, he's a writer, record writer. He's also an actor, isn't he? Yeah, he's an actor. He's here. He's really good. Hi. What do you think, Tony, about all of this newfounded career for your sister Tina Marie? She's great. I know you've been been involved in. You know, I know you love smoking. But like a lot of black stars in entertainment for a long time. Did that give you a problem in growing up, you know, associating yourself with that type of music as a, a little white girl well, in this world? Was that any kind of a problem? In dealing well, with it was, it, 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 you know, it's, it was never a problem as far as I was concerned. But um, I, can, I can remember being chased home yeah, from school yeah. and... Um, getting picked on by a lot of the kids and called nigga lover and yeah. like all kind of horrible things you know. and um i used to go up in my room and just like cry and be by myself and write songs and so it doesn't matter because i'm doing what i'm doing now and that's all that's important and it took all of that for me to be the way that i am well if there's any kind of belief in uh, the power of the spirit and the song that you sang, Deja Vu. I'm sure Rick's feelings about you are totally the same because I know for a fact him writing the song for you was written for you. And uh, there's a line, there's a couple lines in it that um, I used to be a queen, you know, on an island by the sea with rainbow colored people, happy as can be. That we never had a problem and we never had a care. Love was ever flowing and the feeling was always shared. And uh, and I think you are Pisces. What's your astrological sign? Pisces. Pisces, and you like the fishes. Oh, oh, so I think um, <laughs> that feeling. Tell us about <clears throat> tell us about your second album. We understand Rick James wasn't a part of that at all, and it's something that your first endeavor into production. Tell us a little bit about that. You worked with Richard Rudolph, many yeah, Richard Rudolph husband. Yeah. What was that like? It, it was great. Um, it was a whole different thing. From, from uh, working with Rick, it was more. It was more. Well, I, I hate to use the word energy level, but uh, you know, it was like a different kind of thing. When I, the second album was like more laid back, and um, it it was. I wrote like nine. Well, there was nine songs. I wrote eight of the songs on the album. And it's a great album too, by the way. Thank you. It's a great album. Behind the Groove, that was a very big hit on the album. Can't play that one. Anybody <laughs> have a guitar? I can play something for you. There's a real special song. Well, there's two. Um, like, I'm not really sure. Many colors. Too many colors. I need to be loved. 
I'm a big fan of Young Love. Young Love. Has a Smokey Robinson kind of feel. Were you very much in, oh, uh, were you very much inspired by Smokey Robinson? Uh, I was like the first person to do Because when I hear your music, I hear a lot of smoke. I hear different things, and that's that's good because there, it's your own spirit, and you're like translating something that you've just felt through hearing and feeling their music. I think that's great. People can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have a song called uh, You Make Love Like Springtime. Well, let's go on to your third album that you wrote and produced without Richard Rudolph or Rick James. You finally did an album on your own, all by yourself. And I want to say that it's a totally incredible, incredible yeah, piece of music. Right totally an incredible piece of music. It seems like you went on from Rick James, which was uh, working with him and getting into the funk side of things, and you went on with Richard Rudolph into the mellower orchestrated string things and we learned both things and then you went on and applied them both into Tina Marie and I think you made an exciting new incredible album tell us about that how did that happen uh, what possessed well, it was you really to kind of a shock you know I, I used the demo they have a demo studio at Motown and as an artist I probably frequent the studio the demo studio more than anyone there I don't know any other what is artists. a demo studio it's, it's a it's a little studio that's only like eight tracks, you know, and you can bounce them over and have 16, and I would go in and record, well, it's demonstration tapes, you know, and I would go and record the songs, and, um, you know, uh... So it's kind of like an experimental thing. I mean. Yeah, yeah, and what happened was, uh, I was, you know, like, trying to think who I, you know, I could work with the third album, because I didn't know they were going to let me produce it. And it just happened that uh, Mr. Gordy heard my demos. Mr. Gordy, is that Barry Gordy? Yeah, Barry Gordy, and, and like he was so. Yeah. What is Barry Gordy like? Pardon me. What is Barry Gordy like? BG. We've heard so much uh, about him. What is a man like to Tina Marie? Um, the man, the, the man is a genius. You know, he has to give man all the credit that he needs to. You know, he, he did so much for uh, for the. Uh, advancement of black people as far as, uh, you know, not just the music, but, you know, making the black man proud, you know, and yes, Motown came along at just like the right time. He's definitely an institution. And, and, yeah, and like it was, like it was like really needed, you know, because... We understand he has a movie planned for you too, we understand he's contemplating a movie for you, is that true or is that just hearsay? Uh, yeah, Our sources are right. pretty pretty good now, Tina. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, well, maybe you know more than I do. <laughs> Can you play for us something from your latest LP? Sure. Uh, I heard you say something. You make love like springtime. Yeah, that, I like that uh, one. I'd like to tell you a little bit about that song. It was real funny because I recorded the whole album except for that song, and, and I needed one more song to do on the album. And I was going through this thing while I was in the studio. It was real heavy metal, metal tripping, spiritual type of thing that I, I never had really experienced before. It keeps getting stronger as the days go on. But I kept, you know, like saying to myself, God, you know, the Lord is trying to tell me something. And I didn't know what it was, and I have insomnia real bad. And uh, I went to sleep one night. Well, I couldn't sleep. And it was like 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was still looking up at the ceiling, you know, getting real frustrated. So I said, well, I'll get up and uh, take a hot bath. Maybe that'll knock me out. And I got up and I played Songs in the Key of Life, which is like real inspirational to me. There's one particular side with uh, uh, Summer Soft and, and Ordinary Pain. Stevie Wonder is great album. And um, so I, I played that. I started playing Mini Whipper Timber. I was a little too depressed for that that morning. <laughs> so I played that and I went to sleep. And I dreamt this, that I was in the studio listening to this like beautiful music. And my engineer said, are, are you ready to take one? And I said, what are you talking about? This isn't my song. And he said, hey, what do you, you know, you're always playing games. I said, this isn't my song. And then Gio, my sister, came and she's over there. 
she came in and she said, what are you doing? You know, I said, well, this isn't my song. He wants me to sing this song. And she goes, would you go on and sing the song? And I woke up and I remembered it. And um, I looked around my room and, you know, I said, um, wow, I said, I'm sorry. I said, you tell me things every day and I just don't listen, you know. And mm -hmm. this, I was real sorry. And I went and sat down at the piano. And I played a couple notes and I said, no, that's not it. And I looked at the piano and I just went... Same lines. I remember when you was doing um, Deja Vu at the end. You started crying. Yeah. You were so deep through that song. She, you know, she just cried at the end of Deja Vu. Yeah, very emotional. Incredible. <clears throat> incredible. Emotional experience. It's a trip. Since then, that's happened a, a couple times. One night, I went to sleep and dreamt that uh, Gladys Knight was singing to me, and it was like really weird. She was singing like, um, 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 oh God, you. You know we belong together, sunshine, rain, and stormy oh. weather. I've been decent, you know. Oh, are you ready? You know, yeah, up in here. You know, I mean, uh -huh. did that sound just like a song for her? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And I dreamt it, you know. I have to give it. So that happens to you a lot when you get these feelings. Uh, yeah. That's like happened three times, three, four times. Since. Cause you have another song that you wrote for. Uh, we had a stand for Teddy Pendergrass with him in mind totally. Yeah. I heard that you and Rick were out together one night and you, and uh, ran into Teddy and he was sitting down and Rick told him about the song. Yeah. Why don't you play a little bit of uh, Roses or something? I, I can't remember. Do you write songs on guitar too? Do you, you also play guitar? We understand. Right. You write guitar and percussion. Uh, yeah. I, I don't play anything great. Oh, tell me something. You just went to England. Oh, yeah. And we understand you wrote a song when you were over there. Maybe Tom can give you his guitar. Oh. It's Tom McDermott of the Stone City Band, isn't it? California. <laughs> Talking white folk. <laughs> we have some of the Stone City Band saying, why don't we get a shot of <coughs> say, <coughs> Levi Ruffin, synthesizing keyboard player with the Stone City Band. Danny Lamell, uh, lead horn player for the Punk Funk Horns. Creator of Language Use. Tom McDermott, guitar player for the Stone City Band. Erskine Williams, Ross Nodman, keyboard player. Lannis Hughes, drummer for the Stone City Band. California St. Clair, ballet for the Stone City Band. Dark Vader, Stone City Security. Nate Hughes, percussionist for Stone City Band. Madam Jill, Tina Marie's sister, and singer in Deja Vu. Tony, Tina Marie's brother. Our sushi lady over there, who is a great string player. There's her almighty guru and master standing behind, leader of the string section known as Oakland, the Oakland Stroke, strings, uh, Oakland Strings, Oakland Strings, right, 
Matter of fact, we hear that uh, you did some playing on one of Rick James's albums, didn't you? Which one was that? Yeah, that one. Probably the only one that's not known. One kill. real string. Dark kill. That's Larry, by the way. It's good for the Ricks and the group. Dark Rain will kill, too. Garden of Love album we hear they did. Him and his string players did a great job on that. Was that different playing strings on funky music for you? No, it was much better. You enjoy that? I will do it again. Yes, I'm sure. And there's some other people sitting around. Who are these ladies sitting around here? <laughs> maybe, you can maybe they can introduce themselves. You people seem to have like a lot of fun when you uh, are. What are you? Are you rehearsing or what is this? You preparing for an album? Yeah, man. We just. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk to you a little bit about that. But what are, what, what are the ladies' names so we can just? Yolanda. Yolanda. Cowboy Edward. Cowboy. Yolanda is a very attractive, very attractive lady. Who's the other lady behind you, man? Mary. Mary, how are you, Mary? Very lovely looking lady. Thanks for having me on that. And it's Alicia over here. And who? But everything. And I think we met her earlier. I think that's Jamila. Are you like the band's girlfriends or wives? Are you? Or are you just friends of the band? Oh, okay. We didn't mean to. So you all seem to be having a great time. Back to Tina Marie, ladies and gentlemen. Back to Tina Marie, or otherwise known as Lady T. Uh, to get back to my last thought, we just went to England. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? It was a promotional tour I sang in uh, the discos over there and uh, uh, shot you know, these pictures and, and interviews in the daytime and sang at night. What was the reaction, basically? Oh, oh great. It was really great. At this time, your record right here was number one in England, wasn't it? Well, it was like two or three, I think. But it was a big success in England. Right. <laughs> did they, did they, uh, as you might say, did they freak out or anything when they saw this oh, yeah. white girl? One, I thought it was going to get, like, tapped on. Ah, the wow. Everybody tells me it's like this, you know? Brothers and sisters and white people sitting in my So it was a good Did you, um, we understand that you, uh, kind of wrote, you got home, so you wrote a song. Yeah, uh, Where's California? I had jet lag for the first four days that I was there. And then with my insomnia, it kind of messed me up. And one morning about six o'clock, I went down in the lobby and I sat down and I started to cry, you know.
Pepper. The valet what is what is explain you know, let's talk to you for what is a valet what does the valet, valet do for the stone city band uh, which um i'd say whatever it's going to take to make the band happy you know like you know packing clothes answering phones you know making sure like this guy and this guy and this guy is well, how oh, long how long have you there? how long have you been doing this uh, for about three years and uh the next question is coming up i know where do i think of rick james um James. How did you meet Rick James? How did I meet him? I, I have no idea. Like How, no, no, we, no. I was at a club in Buffalo. I was a disc jockey. And uh, Rick and I had met. And the vibes were tremendous. I mean, the vibes were really earthy. So I got into Rick and Rick got into me and we exchanged viewpoints. I was like real high. High at the time. Right, right. What he said. And I was real high and I saw Rick and he was real. Was Rick? Real was Rick, small. Was Rick, Real uh, was Rick successful in this point in time? He was getting time? into a lot of things. He had Modo Records happening. He had a hit in Buffalo as for, company, didn't you know, as a regional type hit. It was in Toronto and the uh, Ontario region. It was like a, more or less a regional hit. And it was um, a really good track. So he brought me a cassette one night. I was like spinning and having a great time. And he, in other words, you, you yeah, played records in a club. Yeah, and, I was, and I was he used to go there. a bunch of things. I was... Uh, that I thought was my dog. Everything except I'm with him now, and maybe that's his loss or my gain or his gain or my loss. What do you mean he was a speedy person? He was like a person who had a lot of things happening in his head as far as genius status is concerned, I believe. 
he just he was producing he was arranging he had been with a lot of uh uh big white boys big white boys yeah heavy white cats that were like uh stepping wolf and a few things and he was like real you know interesting he was a, a man that i respected as far as his musical knowledge and well how did it happen where you came on the road with him as being a disc jockey well i kind of gave up everything to do this because i felt there was a future with rick and the stone city band and how did he put this to you how did you well he really I mean, liked, you had no um, experience being a valet how did you happen to end up with rick whatever one it's going to take to make the band happy i feel you can do what you can do if you want to do it bad enough so I what was the first out. tour like going out with Rick James? It was hell, LA. really. It <laughs> was like, I went through a lot of things of a lot of people telling me a lot of things, but I listened, which is, I think, important in this business. Um, you listen. You have to, like, really pay attention. I really, I learned what I learned from expertise, and you have to do that. You have to really sit down and listen in this business to understand it. Exactly what you want. How about Leon? Leon was a friend of mine who became not a friend after a period of time. Who is who is Leon? Leon was a valet that I learned from. I learned how to uh, do a lot of things to unlearn myself. It's like unwave or something. So now you're California, just I'm, known as California. Do you have a real no, name a real or is that name. your real name? My real name is like Edward Covington, which is not really... You know, it we, doesn't really I think we have it on our records here that you used to be a, a school teacher. I, I, I taught school for a reading, period of two. Yeah, reading and opportunity development, which was like making kids aware of, I guess, themselves and what they should do after they go beyond school. You know, I had a feeling I should do that, so I did that. Well, I think you're a very interesting person to go from school teacher to disc jockey to valet with a rock and roll band. Where's Rick James? <laughs> I want, I want to speak with He's you. in the wind. Sitting behind you. Who He's is the gentleman behind sitting behind you? Dark Vader. This is not Rick James. Dark Vader. Friend of mine. Is that Dark anything Vader. like Darth Vader from <laughs> Star Wars? Dark Vader. That must not be your real name. What's I your name? <laughs> okay. Are you Rick? Big neck. <laughs> Big arm. What, what is your name and what is your job? What's real hard? My name is Bob, Bob Lamell or Robert with Bird. What would you prefer us to call you? Carrie. You, you look pretty big. What do you prefer us to call you? Bob. Okay, Bob. What do you do with respect? What do you respectfully? What do you do with the Stone City Band? Well, and Rick James. Kick ass. Kick ass. What does that mean? Kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can you elaborate on that? Enough light on him or what? That means uh, violence. <laughs> do you, is there a lot of violence with Rick and the band? There's a whole lot of violence because you're dealing with twelve different personalities plus my own. So. I had to put all this abundance and still be cool to take all the shit that's coming in and that I'm putting out. Do you also go on the road with Rick yes, and the band? I do. I do. What is, a, what is a day like of your day? Tell us what your day is like on the road. Tell us what it's like for Bob's day with the Stone City Band. What do you do in the morning till night, say of the day of a concert? What is the program? All right, well, first you have to get there about 6 o'clock to make sure all the doors at night or in the morning. At, at night, in the evening, in like two hours, four times a time. Take the uh, fire marshals, make sure all our uh, explosives are ready. There are people out the way. You have to check the uh, entrances and the exits. You have to drugs in the, in the drugs. The drugs. Yeah, yeah. you have to look out for that. Keep out the bums and bums. and watch the front gates. A lot of things. Anything you think. If people wouldn't think about what about yeah. girls and groupies girls. and fans? Chicks. Are they much of a problem? Chicks. Chicks. Yes, they are at times. They are because those are most oh. frantic people to work with because oh. you can't never really judge. You just can't walk up to a woman and punch her out. <laughs> well, why would you want to punch her out? Is it, it does does women chase the band or Rick? Do they like be over them trying to get to them? No question about it. This is a very hot band and it'll always be hot. You get on stage when they're on stage performing? You mean you have to run on stage after women to throw them off and things? Oh, about five or six times. Bob, I heard you uh, almost broke a column down on one side of the stage. <laughs> Somebody walked on stage and you rushed him like he was playing feet ball. You hit him with a, with a low shoulder into the cavity. <laughs> my friend too. You knocked him all off. Yeah, you killed about four or five people. Bob, how many? Man, don't how many? Job, uh, you, 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 uh, you can't be the only one. Uh, do you have other security men you work with? Oh uh, yes, there's Wesley Carmack. We call him um, Preacher Man. That's there's the six Ed foot Johnson. five security man, right? Head Johnson is Rick Brothers. Hello. There's uh, Moe. He was with us. Now he's not. And there was uh, Winston. So you have basically five to six security men on the road. Yes, yes, you take that many security men for a band? Well, it's a very big band. All of them are very wild. 
Have you ever had any instances where you and Rick yourselves got in a physical confrontation? Oh, yes, Georgetown. Georgetown. We went into a pity and beer joint. <laughs> had it out. What do you mean by? What do you mean by had it out? <laughs> what do you mean by you had it out? Well, it was one of his frustrating days, and uh, he went out shopping and got into a scuffle. I happened to be asleep on the bus. <laughs> I got up, got chewed out, you know. We passed the guys he had to scuffle with, and they gave the finger to the bus. So we're in the middle of Georgetown, stopped in the middle of traffic, bus and all. Jumped off the bus, running to a bar. Hey, 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 hey. Man, Danny was there, but we couldn't see the guys. Rick came in, there they were. And we went to the back of the bar, and there they were. <laughs> you mean you stood in a bar, you and Rick James, fighting a back bunch of back. people in a bar? Uh, me and baby Whether it was it a black bar or was it a white bar? White bar. Kitties and beer. Pink people. You mean you were accosted by, by white me. men at a time while you are fighting in a bar? Yes. How did that situation ever happen? And you lived to talk about it? Yes. Very good. Amazing. Was there a strip teaser on stage while this was happening? <laughs> yes, it was. I got it. Was. It sounds like a scene out of a Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah. Did you and Rick manage to get out uh, without any bruises? Well, we're still here today laughing and talking. Tell them about your eyes. Bob LaMelle. I got hit in the eye. I got hit in the eye in my life. You know, I cried a minute. You know, because it takes that. He's my friend. Mr. LaMelle. You know. Mr. Lamel, I heard there was a situation that happened in, in um, Louisville, Kentucky, uh -huh. where some, some white folks were calling people in the band Nicks. Yeah, we pulled up Nicks to, go home. We pulled up to the plan. hotel. A few rednecks came up to us, you know. What we happened? We got off the bus. It was in the bar, Erskine, and a few other band members went to have a drink. Mm -hmm. And they hollered, yeah. niggas go home. <laughs> Nicks, so I left. They took. <laughs> you know, we was in the lobby, and Wesley and Head, who's not here now, good friends of mine. We, Took care of him. Oh, you mean Head Johnson, Rick's brother? Yeah, Head Mo Shea. Head Mo Shea. Good person. Big water head nigga. Yeah, good that person. That sounds very interesting. Good who's who's the, the fellow with the uh, saxophone? Why don't we let's talk a little bit to him? Juice. He looks the quiet one. Juice, 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 juice. juice. Daniel Lamel. We heard a lot about Daniel Lamel. What have you heard? <laughs> <laughs> it may be true. Maybe. We have a dossier on every one of you people. We know all about you. Daniel and Mel. Daniel, explain something to me. Um, you're the horn player with the Stone City Band. And you seem to be very good friends with Tina Marie, Lady T, as she's called. Um, is there a personal... We read in the Inquiry magazine that you and Tina Marie have a personal hatred towards each other. That she's never invited you on any of her albums. That she doesn't want you to play. I, I'd like you to elaborate on that and tell us what that's about. Well, okay, you see, I have a big, first big opportunity to play on Tina's first album with Rick James, and then she went to a second album. And we weren't called. I wasn't called. The bass player wasn't called. We would have loved to have been there. Oscar. Oh, but no one called us. There was one song in particular where there was a nice part for saxophone. She was just asking a saxophone player to play. I thought maybe I'd get a call, but there was no call. Juice. Couldn't quit a part. Language. It would have been absolutely beautiful had we done it. It was beautiful anyway, but it could have been so much fun. Didn't call us the second album. Then the third album came out. Didn't call us again. But there's a fourth one in the making, so hopefully... Myself, Oscar the bass. In other words, that's just really talk. In other words, you two guys really love each other. Yeah, we really do. You, you were out on tour and... Can I say something? I had to like prove it to so other people. Other people. You did. That I can do it. You did that. No problem. You did that. The Skull City Band, I think they understand that they always in a suit. You could always have done it by yourself. That's true. Tina Marie. Tina Marie. Anyway, Tina, Lady T, we're not going to keep you, but we're just glad that you had time to sit down and. Well, Danny and I are going to record a new song. Oh, we have to go. And you heard it first. We have to go. Tina? Sunny Skies. 
Play something together, maybe before we go and say goodbye. Maybe you and Danny Lamel can play Young Lover or something. Danny Lamel, we you've played on every song Rick James has done. Is that yeah, true? All of them. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're the horn we hear and come into my life and yeah. your love is gone. And love is gone. Fire it up. Yeah. Busting out and no, not busting out. Did you also play on Tina Marie's I'm Just a Sucker for Your Love? I played on that, I played on Deja Vu, a few other things. Okay. Everything. All you my have my yeah. cake? What is Rick's plans with you? We hear that he's planning well, to do something with you. solo album. Termination. <laughs> yeah. Could be that too. No, there's a solo album in the making now. Uh, we're both writing material for it. It's going to be hot. Guaranteed. Is it going to be another new wave funk? Yes, yeah, it's going to be a total new wave idea. Total instrumental vocals or just instrumental? Uh, it'll be both, actually. Be great. This is aside from the Stone City Band and aside from the Mary Jane Band and yeah, aside from Rick totally different. And Rick James. <laughs> well, we. Uh, Who's going to play music though? Yeah. Oh, we definitely be Stone City Band. In other words, you know, you think that Stone City Band has enough versatility to play all? Oh, there's no no question. No question. Just no question. You use no outside musicians? Well, I may have done it. I may have done it. I may have done it. I don't think that there's a need because we, like Levi said, we're so diverse in our music. Like now we're working on a fusion song that uh, the guitar player with Tom McDermott. Mm -hmm. And that's quite different from anything we've played before, but it's... So well, this sounds like as far as Rick James, Tina Marie, Stone City Band, Mary Jane Band, Punk Funk yeah, Horns, yeah, Danny the Mel. This sounds like a dynasty in uh, popular dynasty music getting ready to happen. I, I, it sounds to me like a dynasty happening. Sounds like a label to me. Label, man. I could be right now. How many platinum records does uh, Rick James have? A lot. Well, I think to date it's about five. Now he's sold quite, I mean... And we hear that Tina thing. Marie is uh, on her way to gold. Yeah, definitely. We hear every album no. is gold and should be gold. Are we like white boys do with the first millions of records? White boys? I would say that. Yeah. Yeah. Category I've been meaning to ask Tina Marie and Stone City yeah. Band about this. What do you think the future of music will be? Tina, what do you think? Where do you think music is going? Where is it going? Where is it going? Well, to the bank. <laughs> I don't know, it's going everywhere, you know, it's like... Well, I think that pretty music is coming back. And I'm really glad ballads and, and, you know, important music, songs with messages. Mm -hmm. Lots. Just, in other words, lyrical content. Songs like you write. Lots. Thank you. Definitely. Content, lyrics, and things that make you happy. Do you think um, videos, as such as we're doing now, are important to music? Sure. People have to see you. It's the next phase. It's definitely the next phase. It's already here. Mm -hmm. really? What do you think about that Stone City Band? Videos was happening, man. But then again, learning from Mr. James, Rick, I think everybody in the band has learned how to write songs with lyrical content. As opposed to just bapping and saying, we rock and wop, can't stand it no more. We have learned from Mr. James, and Tina's I mean, a prime example of that. I don't think you should really uh, refer to him as Mr. James. It might make people think he's Dick Jones. Dick <laughs> Joe, that's fine. Uh, Dick Jones. <laughs> Rick James has always instilled in everybody in the, in the group, everybody that we worked with, like Tina and everybody else, when you write a song, make sure you have lyrical content in the song, bitch. I mean, say something, tell a story, elaborate on it, mm -hmm. and then put a hook on it that even enhances that much more. Will Stone City Band or Tina Marie ever do a song with Dum Doo Doo Wah, Doo Wah, Boo Shoo Wah Wah? Possibly. But it'd be a long time from now if that's what's happening. But then again, I don't think so. The only thing that dum dum why and wop shi wah will be be on the goddamn harmony. There will be no lyrics saying dum dum why. So we can expect the lyrical content to come from you. Lyrical content. That's the great. Is the must. I think we need some more of that. To to Tina Marie. Tina Marie. Lady T. <laughs> You're going to play something for us, you and Danny, I asked you, and we can kind of just close this yes, please, evening. Please don't take away my funny stuff. Oh. Very pretty.
Maybe sit on the same chair with her. Maybe set up an intimate mood. Sit backwards. Yeah, that's nice.